Well, hello, endowed ladies. I'm here. I'm smiling super big. So if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, you're seeing my big, big smile. And if you're listening to this in the podcast, you just have to hear the smile through my voice because I'm here with, her nickname is Gina, but her, her, her full official name is Carmen Brice Daniel. And I'm, last time I talked to Gina, I'm just going to, is it okay if I call you Gina, Gina? Please, if you call me Carmen, I'd be like, what's this? Who is that? Yes. <laughs> we talked on Instagram Live over a year ago with Endow. And now I'm thinking, well, that was silly because it, Instagram stories are deleted after 24 <laughs> hours. So now we have this forever. But Gina, welcome to the Endow podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about it's an excuse for us to do our favorite things. Talk about God and all the ministry and then talk to each other. So it's Exactly. Great. I wanted an excuse to catch up with my friends. So here we are. Okay. So this episode, let's try to focus because you and I can, <laughs> we can go off and talk about a million different things. But uh, it is the month of uh, St. Catherine of Siena for her feast day. And I want to talk to you about her because my, this is how I, this is, you are kind of my first introduction to St. Catherine of Siena about what 12 years ago something more nice. more because i was thinking i was consecrated almost 12 years ago and we were friends before that so okay yeah exactly and we were drinking cinnamon coffee and you were reading the dialogues and you're yeah. like this woman it's a bit intense I, <laughs> you, you told me a few stories like what if it's intense for you i need to wait a long time <laughs> so i <laughs> to get in, to start to wrap my mind around Catherine of Siena. And then I'd love to talk to you about your vocation to consecrated virginity, sacred print, and all this kind of stuff. So Tina, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, like you said, my name is Carmen Briseño. Nobody calls me Carmen. Everybody calls me Tina. Um, and I'm originally from Venezuela, but I've been living like in the U.S. and Venezuela here and there. As you said, in 2009, I was consecrated to the Order of Virgins, which is out of control. It's been like this August, granted, August just passed, but still, it'll be 12 years, which is crazy. God has just been so good, so faithful. And it's so funny because you're like, and what do you do? Because when we met, I was a student working with a priest friend of mine. Then I started to teach. Then I did mission work. And then I just kind of felt, then I did youth ministry. Yes. And now people are like, what do you do? And I, I hate saying like self-employed because it sounds like so like whatever. But I, I like to say missionary because but it's a little bit of everything. So I give talks, retreats. I do a lot of art. Like we'll talk about it in a second about how God doesn't take your talents and say, oh, how nice. I'm so glad that you used to like to do that. I'm like, throw it away. But he'll grab it and just like explode it, you know? So I do a lot of things with art. So it's difficult. People are like, are you on your way to work? I'm like, um. I'm always working. For the I don't know what that's yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's an annoying question. And I'm sorry I asked it, but there's no way that you have to start from somewhere, right? I mean, because really your whole life is a vocation. Really. Yeah. Your whole life. No, absolutely. And it's just so beautiful. Like I remember when I was discerning a lot of vocations, um, I love religious life. I was taught by Dominicans almost my entire life. Like, love it. It's beautiful. But I just never felt called to that. And what I loved about Consecrated Virginity, it was like me and giving all my talents, all my craziness and gifts to God and God can use it in every way. So I love to give talks and retreats in English and Spanish. I'm able to do that. I've always loved to draw. When I was younger, I wanted to be a Disney animator but then God channeled it, right? And so now I do. Gently um, redirects it as he does. Redirect, but in a, oh my gosh, in a, a thousand times more beautiful way. So I started a little company called Sacred Print. And so I do a lot of, oh my gosh, everything. But saints, I'm obsessed. Like, I, I, like yes. you have no idea, Simone. I was bad before, but now I'm, at, I'm like a little, it's too much. It's a bit much. Um, <laughs> no, I, can't, I can't say that because I, I'm also obsessed with the saints, but yeah, no, you get me. You get me. I get you. I get mm -hmm. you. Um, okay. So where do we, where do we begin here? Let's okay. China, when I yeah. met you in 2008 or earlier, no, 2008. Yeah. No, I, I think as we were studying our masters. So I think that was a six around there. I don't know. My goodness. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, whatever it was. Well, I think, okay, whatever details. But the point is, is that I had just been introduced as a Catholic to the idea of like you can be a celibate that's not a priest or a nun or a, yeah. I mean I didn't, so I had just met some lay celibates which is a little bit different than what you are mm -hmm. but that whole idea of like what St. Catherine of Siena was a lay Dominican uh, I did not really know that that was a thing in the present at least but definitely as a thing until hmm, 
2006, 2005. And then meeting you, there was this whole other category of consecrated virginity. So, you know, you're not like I would say a typical anybody because you're totally unique and unrepeatable. But I think what I love about your vocation story is that it's so uniquely designed for you. So tell us, what does it mean to be a consecrated virgin? Well, I mean, it's not like you, I can't believe you didn't know about consecrated virginity. Me neither, right? Because all I knew was about religious sisters. Um, But trying to make a long story short, I went to World Youth Day and just really felt God saying, like, you've given time and attention to guys and things like, what about me? But in my head, that meant like religious sister. And I love them, but I wasn't attracted to them. So people are like, why not? And it's like, as if you have a best friend that you're great friends, but you're just not attracted. I mean, there's nothing wrong. It's just not, not the right fit. Right. Right. I found out about consecrated virginity actually through Maria Lisa, Father Juan's sister. And I like fell in love because virginity for me was always really important. Just the idea of a complete gift of self. So that was always really important to me. And then just the thought, how ancient this vocation was like before they were even religious sisters you know yeah. like one of the earliest forms of consecration that women were just like i just want to belong to god and at first they lived you know in their houses dedicated to the works of mercy um and just to belong fully to god that way and at first i was like but how like that's crazy because i mean you know me it's not i'm i don't know like in my head i guess you had to be like super strictly pious we have like these ideas of what it means to belong fully to god that yeah 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 exactly exactly and then the real thing is the saints were not monolithic the saints are super diverse big personalities you know (laughs) personality i mean every every kind of distinct thing and so yeah we get these ideas that somehow sanctity looks totally the same and it's all very Uh quiet so what you know but the reality is the saints are also different but um i love that what you love about your vocation is that it was like pre-christian like before christianity was like even legal or like cultural you're like women were giving themselves fully to jesus in this way before people even knew what christianity was yeah (laughs) and it's incredible because they're the first early virgin martyrs right because at first it was you know just like a vow and so men would want to marry them like sorry i belong fully to god and so they'd be martyred but then it became official in the sense that the bishop would consecrate them so it's not a private vow like it's not just i which private vows are amazing but it's not a private vow of just like chastity or celibacy right it is a whole right a whole so, consecration thing yeah 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 and it's amazing to read how saint ambrose like consecrated his sister you know and 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 these popes and just all these people and just be like that is it's insane you know and so to see that god can use my gifts and talents and i've seen him do that throughout those years and it's just been so beautiful yeah just really, yeah really grateful yeah, what's amazing about what you're saying is that, especially for your personality, um, consecrated virginity gives you the strict form of like celibacy, but then the um, freedom to pursue like all of your gifts and charisms and what you do that you in, in other way, in other like in, an, in another form of celibacy, like a nun or a cloister, you simply couldn't do that. Um, no. mm-hmm. So that's great. Funny you should mention St. Ambrose because I just read his. Uh, letters on virginity which his sister encouraged him to write oh there you Just go a little shout out to the feminine genius we wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't have had saint ambrose's letters on virginity and the value of virginity if it wasn't for his sister being like hey brother you need to write about this mm-hmm. and i met you along with maria lisa who's who is also a consecrated virgin as you mentioned whose brother is father juan who i mean i just i love i just love like brother sister soul yeah Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, and they're amazing. We've been friends for so long. Like, I, by the way, like his anniversary is gonna be twenty years of priest uh, right now in March, which is crazy. And it's just like the gift of celibacy just gives, like, keeps on giving. Like, I've been able to see how fruitful it's been for him and his ministry, what it's meant for me, and just like where God puts people and how He uses us. It's just fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you're his. In I mean, many ways, you're his spiritual daughter. So oh, in every way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. okay, so then. I want to link to something. Where can girls who are listening to this or women who learn about like, oh my gosh, there's this thing called Hearts of Great Virginity. Like, can they talk to you, Tina? Can they, yeah. can they find a website? Can they, can we, can we put you out there? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, two things. 
So consecratedvirgins.org is a website. Um, and so that really gives a whole lot more information. They've done a great job of also putting like the history, the letters, like, you know, church fathers, what they've said, the Vatican came out with an instruction. Um, so that's, you can have that there. I have a great friend who recently became a consecrated virgin, also from the Diocese of Lansing, like Lansing is exploding. Yeah. Uh, um, with me as absolutely, and this is not like a plug necessarily, but my website is like sacredprint.com and like there it's a contact me. So it doesn't have to be about art. Yeah. Um, just contact me, but it's just easier to send people to the website than just like blurt out my personal email, right? Yes, but, I know. Yeah. I didn't prepare you for this. We didn't prepare for this, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought, I think no, it's please. And it's so important to talk to people um, just in general, because this vocation, it's beautiful, but it is difficult in the sense that like, if you're a married person, you get married and all of a sudden, hopefully, right? You're like, you haven't lived with anybody. So now you're living with your husband and now a whole new life or like adventure religious life. Like you get a new name, you get a habit. But like with this specific vocation, um, you know, when you're consecrated, sure, everything changes internally, but ex externally nothing changes. Like yeah. you don't, you know what I mean? You join an order, meaning orders in a group of people, but it's not a religious order in that yes. sense. Yes, yes. And so like, unless you've already been living as a consecrated virgin, like unless you've already been living dedicated to God, then don't, I mean, things are not going to change in that way. Like, you know what I mean? You do so, have to pray the office though, right? You do have. Yes. Well, that is true. Yeah, yeah. But I guess, again, with Father Juan, like, what you, is you still have to set your schedule. You still have to get yourself to it. It's not like there's going to be anybody checking up on you. Nobody. Yeah. I mean, you have your spiritual director, hopefully, right? And sure, you'll meet with the bishop once or twice a year, but it really is that. So people are like, how do I discern? I think this is the easiest vocation to discern because you have to ask yourself, how have I been living? Have I been living it well? Am I giving myself fully to God? Like, how can I give myself more? Because that's what it is. Nobody, I mean, sure, you'll create your rule of life, but hopefully you've been doing that before, you know? Right. So. But maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody listening who's like, they're going to figure all that out in, along with the uh, discernment, um, you know. Yeah. You never know. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. It can be weird a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, I did, I, I want to also link up to this episode, the article that, what was the, what was the, um, what was the article cool. about you in a secular magazine? Tell us about so that experience. A short version of it was crazy. Somebody wrote for me from good housekeeping magazine and they wanted to write an article about consecrated virginity which is like that makes no sense like <laughs> good housekeeping it's like here's a lamp here's a couch here's a consecrated virgin like it makes no sense like why <laughs> are they gonna write i was like what i was like nobody's gonna read it so they did the article and the only reason why i know that of what happened was because i have an etsy shop too um and so i started getting like a lot of etsy sales and just like you could see how people were finding you and then it said like cosmopolitan i'm like cosmopolitan I'm like what yeah, is going on say, cosmo found you cosmo so what cosmo did is that they got the article and they published it That's so it was originally a good housekeeping but then it went to cosmo and it was crazy because even online like when you read the article it was like that and then like on the side was like 50 shades of gray i'm like what is going on right so it was like, like crazy because they have like their secular stuff we're, you know we're, catholics are trying to like get into these secular magazines so hard and kind of like propose a christian worldview in all these arenas and like the peripheries and what's more peripheral than cosmo i mean talk about women that need to know about their unique feminine genius that's a great virginity and crazy is the holy spirit's great because if Cosmo had told me we're going to write an article about consecrated virginity, I'd be like, heck no. Because I wouldn't trust that they would, like, no. I would have said, I like, would have no. been like, Gina, you have to do it. You've got to do it. you got to evangelize. You would have been like, go. And I would be like, no. <laughs> You're like, these people won't listen to me. And I would have been like, you've got to try. We've got to reach Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. But it was crazy. And you would think that, like, so many people wrote. It was, like, crazy, crazy, crazy. It was even, like, on Yahoo Sports, which makes no sense. Um, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, what does that have to do with anything? But what happened was then that, uh, yeah, and then all, all like 100% of the feedback was positive, like 100%. People would be like, I have no idea what this is about, but what a beautiful story. Like, it was just, you know, you would think that these crazy people, it's like 60 tips for craziness. But doesn't that 
speak to it is like like just to quote you from five minutes ago uh the holy spirit is great because you think I mean, these you could say this is a reduction and nobody is our enemy you know in a true sense right because everybody's a child of god but like you would think cosmo is like the enemy right yeah. and yet like the beauty of your life and the beauty of your vocation like beauty breaks through all of that you know yeah i, mean, I agree I mother, it's mother, mother Teresa doing a pro-life child at harvard right <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they're all like giving her a standing ovation why because the beauty like the beauty of her life and her her calling so i have to link that to this podcast episode but yeah. you were and i'm not just saying this i think i told you this like that day it was the most beautiful bride i've ever seen you're the sweetest it was i just felt like i was just so happy so it's really funny because i went to my friend maria lisa as we talked about before her consecration when she was prostrated she was like crying so you could see like i mean out of joy right but she could see like her body like because like you yeah. fully prostrate i was like i'm gonna lose it i was so happy i'm almost like am i levitating because it was like yeah. i was so happy like you were God, shaking. I, that moment when the bishop put the ring on your finger yeah we were shaking with joy i mean i love I was it so happy yeah it was so beautiful and your veil and your wedding dress everything was yeah. you felt more bridal to me mm. than probably because so many weddings i go to like <laughs> yeah it's not about anyway i'll be careful. <laughs> but i mean you just you truly look felt everything like the most beautiful bride i'd ever seen in my life it was such an honor and uh, i felt like you. i was in heaven um and by the way, anybody who's listening, this is how, what a servant heart this crazy woman has. Like she was blowing up balloons. We were just talking about that before. She was doing all sorts of crazy stuff before my consecration. So thank you. <laughs> like a little grandma being like, oh, anyway, um, that was just so awesome. Well, okay. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, gosh, a million things, but I guess on the Catherine of Siena track, because she also had a very unique and rare vocation. Okay. So my encounter with Catherine Stanham, as I mentioned, with you, and you're like, this woman is crazy and crazy. intense, and I can't handle it right now. And I was like, well, okay. So tell me about your love for her and why, and you know, just go ahead. <laughs> She's crazy. Like, I love her. I love her. I love her personality. I didn't realize until, I guess, around that time that my first communion date, like, what is the feast day of Catherine of Siena. And so I was just like, so happy. Yeah. And then I just, I remember way back when reading about her and I was like, you're crazy. I mean, at like four or five, I don't know, she has a vision of like Jesus and like, she already makes a vow. And then, I mean, out of control. And then she serves her parents, like her parents, she's just like praying in her room and her mom's like, you're just being lazy. And so they make her do all sorts of chores and hard work while she's still praying. And she's giving just generously a love of their family. And, and people are looking at it like, how can you treat them so well when your parents are like hideous? And she's like, I just imagine that they're the Holy family. But the craziest thing, which I read a book, which is um, historical fiction, so good. And it's Louis DeWall on Catherine of Siena. And when I read it, I'm like, this must be part of the fiction because there's no way that this is real. Right. Simone, no. This is how intense, which by the way, everybody knows about Catherine of Siena going to like the Pope and being super feisty and like come back to Rome, like, you know, but this is even crazier. So what's crazy the real, the is real that- story. This is the, this is the real, the panning for gold, good stuff. Listen to this. I don't know if you knew this. So No, I don't. I'm sure, I, I assure okay. you I do not. So there's this guy who is a horrible criminal and they're gonna cut off his head the next day or like two days from now. And every time a priest goes in, he's kicking them out, kicking them out. And Catherine and Santa is like, I'm gonna go. And they're like, yeah, right. Like we're gonna send a woman, right? Like by herself in a cell. And she's like, I'm gonna go and nobody can come with me, right? Because she's intense. So she goes in, nobody knows what happened. She comes out and she, he's totally converted, wants to hear a priest and she had promised and this legit happens, um, to hold his head, to be there the next day to hold his head for when they guillotine him. Oh, you stop okay? that. You stop yes. that. <laughs> yes. It's real. It's real. And so she's there, like, holding his head while they, like, guillotine him. I'm like, <sighs> I think I did. Okay, maybe I didn't hear about it. Maybe I did. It doesn't matter because as you're telling it to me right now, this woman is on a whole other level. 
whole other level. And then I love how the fact that like she got into a coma. We don't know like what really what happened. Everybody's like mourning because they think she's dead. And after like two or three days, she wakes up again. And when she sees everybody, she just starts to cry. Right. And everybody's like, oh, what happened? She's like, how am I still alive? Like, you know, like she just wanted to go to heaven. And she's like crying that she didn't die. I just love her. I think she's feisty. She's beautiful. She tells it as it is. She's humble though. Like, you know. Yeah, because only only somebody that's that humble can have that kind of authority. Yeah, well, ooh, that's a good, yeah. I'm stealing that later. Steal, steal it. Steal, steal that quote, yeah. Um, wow, okay, so do you, okay, so speaking of that, you're making me think of the fact that you're mentioning this book. You read like crazy. You're a crazy reader. I love to read, yeah. Now, I'm sure people like myself who are listening to this <laughs> right now, as a, I'm like, well, of course she can read. She's a consecrated virgin, right? She has all the time in the world. Yeah. She has all the time in the world. But that's not true. That's no. not true. You're very busy. How is it that you read so much? Give us some tips. Give me some tips. Well, I mean, this isn't really fair. I just always like to read. It's my pastime. Like, I would much rather read a book and have a cup of coffee than do almost anything else. So it's just like, it's relaxing. <laughs> you so you know? You sound like my uncle who's like, you can either oh. paint or you can't paint. You just can't, <laughs> you know? I don't mean it in a bad way, but I just, I just generally like to read. And then I love to read the lives of the saints. And so yeah. I can't go to sleep. Like my last like 20 minutes, I'm reading a book, not yeah. a spiritual book because I'm not like, no, you read a lot of different stuff. But like, I think what's fascinating to me about you is that you are so extroverted and so like life of the party type, but paradoxically also you love the alone time, the coffee yeah. time, the reading time. I feel like yeah. that's like the real secret about you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's weird. It's weird. I've always said I'm an introvert. People are like, ha I'm like, no, I am. Because I like to be like, I like do it. love that yeah. solitary time, but I do like being with people. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But okay. So for the women who are listening to this and thank you also to our male listeners, why is the intellectual life for women important? Because as you know, Endow creates study guides uh, for mm -hmm. women to access you know, encyclicals and like, it's yeah. not like your everyday person that's like, you know what? I think I'm going to read a papal encyclical. You yeah, know what? Yeah. I think I'm going to study St. Catherine of Siena. That's not typical. It's not even typical. It's not typical in the church. So tell me why, why it's important. How, why, what's the value of cultivating the intellectual life? Well, I think, I mean, if we want to, many things, but if we want to give ourselves to God, that's not just like heart emotions, right? But it is our mind. It is our intellect, right? And so how beautiful that the more we know about God, the more we love him and the more we're able to give, you yeah. know? And so for me, when we, st when we got our master's in theology, it was just explosion after explosion. And so I was hallucinating after almost like every class because it just made me love God more. And it just kept on breaking the molds in my mind yeah. of what is possible and who God is, because if not, otherwise God can be so small, like it's to what you understand him to be. And so to read the encyclicals or the amazing study that you guys have on Catherine of Siena to read about the saints and all these different ways, it's just so enriching. And let me tell you something, Simone, we're filled with a lot of information. Like there's information overload, but there isn't quality. Like there isn't an intellectual life right now. So people think they're being smart because they read snippets of like stuff that's said on Twitter and they have like their blurb that they can like pass out, but <laughs> that doesn't fulfill you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yes, yes, you're right. And I think that's what I love so much about Endow and Endow Women is that this like shared experience of what you're talking about where you're like, wow, I love God more because I'm learning this. And like, my worldview is being blown up and like reshaped and reformed because it's like brand new, beautiful piece of truth um, coming out of the church's intellectual inheritance is like just making me fall in love with God even more. So And honestly, Simone, like the apostolic effectiveness of it, and I'm not talking about being, I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas is brilliant. Like I get it, you know, but, and I'm not saying you have to have all that, but I, okay. I don't know if, I don't know if the listeners know, but like, you're one of the smartest people I know. Okay. Like this girl is super, stop it. Don't be yeah, humble. She say thank you because it's true, uh -huh. but like super smart. And I've seen where your love of God and where your knowledge of God has been like so effective. Like Simone converts anybody she sees with her joy and like with her knowledge, a lived knowledge, you know? And so I think that's so important because people are thirsting, you know, and when you can kind of discern what that thirst is and you know, from experience, from what you've read, you know, from what you've been through or what you know, saints have been through and you're able to share that. 
it's life altering. So, and then like you said, like what Endow does, you create communities of people on fire. I mean, then the what in the world, you know? Like it's women, just, women take over the world. You know, yeah. and there's John Paul II said, like the women are the cultural game changers. Mm. And um, thank you for all those kind affirmations as I yeah. to the next topic. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, John Paul II was, as you mentioned earlier, like crucial for your vocation. Like you yeah. found your vocation, yes, through the people around you, but it was really John Paul II mm -hmm. inspiring and interceding um, for you in your vocation. Um, and, uh, you know, he's just our biggest advocate with the feminine genius. Um, so how, how, John, just, do you want to say a few words on John Paul II and why we need to keep looking to him for our pathway forward? He is, he's my saint crush. Like I've always said, like my saint yeah. crush. People are like Pierre Giorgio, I'm like, take him. I'll, I'll have John Paul. Yeah, yeah. Um, get the Italian guy. I'll take the Polish guy. <laughs> I'll take the Polish guy a thousand times over. And the more I learn about him, like two years ago, I was able to go to Poland. I'm like, this man, like, no, I like love you so much. Um, he was Pope already when I was born. So he was like the only Pope that I knew. I remember seeing him when I was 14, 15, which honestly I couldn't really care much about like my faith, but I was like, oh my gosh, Pope John Paul. Yeah. You know, I just loved him. And then I read Theology of the Body. And so that really changed my life because I didn't, I didn't really know what I truly believed in regards to sexuality. Yeah. And when I read that and I read about the gift of, people think a lot about Theology of the, theology of the Body, obviously about like human sexuality and, and the beauty of sex, but it's also, right, a beauty about self-gift and virginity. And yeah. so when I read that, it changed my life. And so everything, like his his thousands of speeches, which everything is like, be not afraid. I mean, you see the movie of the man and it's almost like, if this was an actual movie, people are like, whatever, like that, whatever happened. Like this guy who's in Poland, like under Hitler, then becomes a Pope. Like it's almost too crazy, you know? Yeah, and this, yeah, yeah. It does have that like Hollywood, like this can't yeah. be a true story. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I agree with you on John Paul II. I mean, he is just something to continue pondering his writings, his life, his witness and everything. I think, you know, in terms of the context of the feminine genius and, and all of that, what he, what he has done for me is really made me feel supported in my mm. personal vocation in that, yes, that maybe it's not going to be like the St. Catherine of Siena kind of influence and power, but that each woman has a personal vocation through her own unique expression, subjective expression of the feminine genius. And John Paul II believed in that so, so much and, um, and advocated for that. So, you know? We were talking about this a little bit before, but I think he's a great one also to keep on going back because I think especially with women now, there's this, always this mentality of doing more, doing, 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 you know what I mean? And just like, it's never enough. They're always giving and still feeling like junk because you're not giving enough. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. Is that one of your pet peeves, uh, China about when people ask about the feminine genius, oftentimes they're asking about like, what can women do? Hmm. And that's kind of annoying question. It's understandable, but it's kind of annoying because the being a woman is not primary. Being a human is not primary about what you do. Right. So you have a new tagline, Every, uh, all women, like, stop, stop being crazy, <laughs> right? Well, it's true, because I'm just thinking, like, especially moms, like, I say it with my sisters, and if I were to tell you, like, if I, honestly, Simone, if I were to tell you, guess what, and I don't, like, I wish I did, but I don't, but if I told you, like, oh, I wake up two times, you know, I wake up at one in the morning to pray for 30 minutes, and then I wake up again at 4.30 to pray for 30 minutes, and then I'm continuously feeding the poor and the hungry. And I, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this woman is a saint. But a mom who wakes up at one in the morning to breastfeed her child for half an hour, then she wakes up again at four in the morning to breastfeed her child. And then, you know, then her kid is crying. And oh, wow. yeah, that's what moms do. It's like, no, like when it says I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Like you're doing this a thousand times in your vocation. I have to be very mindful of like, am I living like a spouse of Christ and a mother to people as legit moms, as like, moms. like as biological moms. Right. Oh, that is such a good point. You know, I have to say, I didn't think about that exactly in those terms. And that's really, really helpful. We do devalue. I mean, I think Catholic women of, of the endowed strain will are very aware of how there's such a huge attack and devaluing of biological motherhood. Mm -hmm. um, and by extension, of course, 
attacking biological mother and spiritual motherhood and consecrated virginity and like every woman being ultimately like called to be a spiritual mother as well. That, forget that. That's not even a discussion, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But <laughs> that's not even on the table. You're some kind of demented freak. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there is this like, do you think it's an American thing? Do you think it's a, like, I'm not doing enough? Because I see it with my mom friends too. Or do no, you think it's, like, it's everything I just think, I, and especially when you add, I don't mean this to be like mean, but like when you have the faith into it, I think there is this mentality also of obviously we do for God, but we also just have to be with God and just love God. Like these moms, I work mostly with Hispanic moms, are insanely generous, have so many issues with their families. Like try to find a Hispanic homeless person. Like you will not. Like everybody's in the home. Like you know what I mean? They will grab this person's uncle, niece, nephew. Like yeah constantly and then they're like oh I don't love God enough or I'm not serving enough it's like look around like a lot of times you think and when I give retreats we talk about them we go through the works of mercy with moms and they're always like I feel so guilty I'm like no no and then I'll literally show a picture of like a cloister nun and then I'll show a, a picture of like a breastfeeding mom I'm like how is this how is this different and you're just continuously literally giving of yourself the thing is that nobody applauds you the thing is that you're like you know, nobody's like, what a holiness. It's just like, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. It's heroic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So what's the remedy to this weird guilt or this, like, I'm not doing enough or, you know, I had a friend who said that his mom had to take like radio, what do you call it? Radiotherapy. That's not what it's called. Radiation. Radiotherapy. I don't, is that what it's called? I don't know. Like when you have cancer, like radiotherapy, oh, radiation, radiation, yeah. radiation, radiation, that's a word. He said that his mom had to do radiation and that she would also make sure she had like, but in Spanish it sounds better, like Cristo Terapia, which is like also just going in front of the Blessed Sacrament, not doing anything and just letting him, oh, letting him work. Yeah, spiritual radiation you know, therapy. Yeah. I think honestly, it's just learning how to just let yourself be loved, like, and that you're worthy of that and just sitting in that, you know, but. And that is what we call, mean by receptivity. Letting mm -hmm. yourself be loved right. by God is what receptivity is. Right, and right, right. That is very, yeah, I mean, very uncomfortable. And that's the, but that's the beauty of it because otherwise, like people, I think about this myself, like people don't need China, people need God. And the only way that I can give God is if I let him like fill me, you know? Yeah, yeah. I love, um, you're a Ratzinger fan, I know. I um, am, yeah. You know, I love what he says and what it means to be a Christian about faith is always an ever present within true loving because mm -hmm. it is just that point in love where you realize that you're limited and you can't mm. uh, give everything that you want that faith kicks in wow and that yeah makes up for the surplus and i think that is the really like the existential discomfort of being a christian is that there's a disproportion between what my heart wants to give and wants to do and the fact that i'm a very like needy fragile limited person and like actually like i have to be in touch with that fragility and that neediness because then i can say okay jesus okay your turn your turn yeah yeah i've been reading um brother lawrence's practice of the presence of god and it's that, so good because it's just funny. like see god in everything you know like he would peel potatoes and it was just like god was there I'm like, really? Like, I need to learn that. I think it's always yes. like these yes. extraordinary things. And it's like, no. It's just the simple, no. humble things. Yeah. My mom loves to bring a brother Lawrence to me because one time she and my sister were laughing. At, I was doing the dishes and my face looked so tortured. <laughs> <laughs> like, how could I, like, I wasn't made for this. Like, I was not made to do all these dishes. Like, again, every day, again. <laughs> and my mom's like, remember brother Lawrence and the potatoes, you know, <laughs> but I, <laughs> but I think you're right. We realize that it's Jesus educates the humanity, our humanity, yeah. the simple humanity. And, uh, and he is there, the natural, uh, actually today's the, the death anniversary of father Louis de Giussani, China. Oh, and, wow. and he would always say like the natural becomes exceptional in the context of Christ. Ooh, say that again. The natural becomes exceptional in the context of Christ. I mean, he yeah. gets it. I'm writing that down. <laughs> I love this. So good. I mean, it's so good. He came to educate the human, right? I mean, he became he became a man. Very, very, uh, very humble thing. Do you remember Sister Timothy Prokes? 
Oh, I love her. I love her. And she, I feel like she would go into like mystical visions during class. <laughs> <laughs> Look out the window and like see God. And I'd like, like what yeah. is she looking at? Yeah, but yeah. Um, why did I bring her up? I think I brought her up. Oh, I love what she'd say in class about um, God becoming man is like us becoming gophers, except worse. <laughs> did she ever say that to you? Probably. I just remember her brilliance way back then. So we're talking like 2008, maybe seven, I don't know when it was. And she was already seeing, she wrote a book because she loved Theology of the Body. She actually taught Theology of the Body. And so she wrote about the meaning of presence and how necessary like physical presence was. And she could already see, meaning that in the Eucharist, and she could already see in this crazy environment where everything is like disconnected, like the need of presence, you know? And I, she was just so brilliant. I agree. She just had this manner about her and she was actually at my consecration. I was so happy that she went. Oh my so gosh. Brilliant. How did I not remember that? But wow. She's in the back. I could see her because of her little veil. Her little veil. Yeah. The, their habits always like made me think of like a Harry Potter costume because they were just like, yeah, no. I don't know, but yeah. Funny. yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right. Well, anything else? I mean, this was um, fantastic. Thank you for sharing your life and your vocation and your thoughts with us. And anything else you'd like to kind of encourage or inspire and endow women, women of the church, faithful daughters of the magisterium and so forth, um, just in this next phase of like a post-COVID world and all the different, you know, the issues we always had that are now exacerbated. Um, any word of encouragement or just tip or something you want to say to them before we say goodbye? Yeah, I was just thinking two things. Like when we give ourselves daily to God and just have like a blank check and just be like, God, whether that's me giving of myself, me receiving of you, because that's important to be receptive, you know, that's a life worth living. So it's not about creating these huge goals, these big plans. I mean, that's nice, but just being, being in the need of God. And I think like with COVID, I know it was really bad with, for a lot of people, but it was a reset for a lot of people to say, okay, what's important, you know, friendship and family and just time for God yeah. and, and the necessity of the sacraments with everything that was going on, you know? And so just encourage one another, like how wonderful that we live in a time where technology can be used well, that you have this, right? And so yes, yes. you're able to connect and that you're able to grow and that we're able to have this community and just continuously encourage each other. And one of my favorite conversion stories period is Ignatius of Loyola. I love how he wasn't like, he had a mystical vision. He just read the lives of like Francis as Dominic and thought if they could do it, why can't I? Like what? that was the thing. And so I just love that. Like, yeah. What would St. Gina look like? And not because I want to be a saint, but just like, but you God. do, you absolutely do. And shouldn't no, you, I do. You want to be, shouldn't you want to be? But but what I mean by that is not, not because of false glory, not, not the, not the like, Oh, I can't wait till my face is on, on a coin or anything like that, but just that exactly. you, you want to be like joyful and happy. And that's what a saint is. Exactly. And so, and just seeing like, again, I was just saying how God uses our talents and whether for me, that's art, you know, and the saints that I do because I'm obsessed with saints. So I need to like get it out. So God uses my, my saint art and all the different things that I do. Yeah. Yep. But your talent for a mom who's hearing us could be literally like caring for their kids or just all these different things. And so just being okay with telling God, like, I just, I just need to be in front of you, love me. And that's good. Like that's the plan for Lent is, you know, or the plan for Easter, the plan for ordinary time, the plan for whatever. The plan for life is just to allow yourself to be filled with God. And that's it. You know what I mean? And yeah, just, I love that. that Actually, be. funny you should say this because that was my big breakthrough during COVID quarantine last year was, well, you'll, you know me. So you'll, you'll just love how stereo, how on brand this was. I was like, wow, COVID uh, quarantine. This is early on. Like, I wonder like what God, what, a, how God's going to like, per, you know, purify me and, you know, shape me into the saint. And you know, <laughs> this must be this like dark time of like, where I'm really going to like turbocharge in the holy. I mean, just like all the drama all the time. <laughs> You know, and like, what is that thing I'm supposed to do? I mean, just so much, you know. And I got stopped on the stairs. And I really feel like Jesus, like in a gentlely violent way, was shook, <laughs> shook my shoulders and was like, maybe I just want time with you. Maybe this isn't about like, I'm going to mold you. I'm going to shape you. I'm about a bang, about a boom. Like, all your horrible defects and qualities are just going to go away. I just, maybe I just want the simplicity of time with you mm -hmm. and 
that moment was a very crucial moment for me because again, as, as I do, as we do, as we struggle with falling into like, what am I going to do, 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 do next, you know? And instead it was just like, maybe just want time with you. Maybe this isn't about like changing you right now, but of course the time always changes. Right. But, but maybe this is just about me sitting with you. Because honestly, that's our preparation for heaven. Like in heaven, we're not going to be feeding the poor and giving clothes to the hungry. Like we're not going to be doing, right? We're going to be being with people and being with God and be just being like, just, just oh being. Gosh. so yes. you prepare for that. Like, you know, and we're like, that, 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 doing. And we're gonna that's be in such a like, great point, Gina. And it reminds me of C.S. Lewis. I don't know where he says this, but he says like, doesn't he say, uh, you know, the Christian life is about getting comfortable with God. Mm, that sounds like Lewisy. <laughs> so, right, yeah, right. Like you, you get to heaven and you want to be comfortable with God. You don't want His presence to be like shocking to you. You don't know what to do with it because you're like busy looking for tasks, right? Like you yeah, want to be comfortable yeah. with Him because you're already in. You already know what it's like to be around Him. You're already com mm -hmm. already comfortable with Him. Mm -hmm. I remember Alfredo. Uh, I don't know if you ever met Alfredo, uh, who he'd come to school community in DC, and he'd be like, "I don't want to." He's from Chile. He'd be like, "I don't want to go to." I don't want to go to heaven and like think this is really weird. I don't want to be weird to me. <laughs> 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 so anyway, you reminded me of all that. Um, anyway, all right. Well, thank you so much, Tina. And we're gonna link up all your stuff, um, Sacred Prints, right? Sacredprint.com mm -hmm. and all your beautiful artwork and and everything. Thank you for being such a beautiful soul. What a joy to be with you and to all the wonderful women really take advantage of these amazing communities and opportunities and studies because people's heart and soul are behind this. And their only reason why you're doing this is because they know it's going to enrich them and bring them closer to God. I mean, that's what you're dedicating your life for, you know? And so, ah, so good and so proud of you, my dear Simoncita. Thank you, Chino.